Our mission at the LAI is to promote and support interdisciplinary uh, teaching, research, and meaningful public engagement to advance the production and dissemination of knowledge about Latin America and Iberia. Latin America is one of seven priority areas of research for UNM, and we proudly contribute to both the university's intellectual community as well as global discourse through programming. Um, I'd like to first acknowledge that the University of New Mexico sits on the traditional homelands of the Pueblo of Sandia. The original peoples of New Mexico, Pueblo, Navajo, and Apache, since time immemorial have deep connections to the land and have made significant contributions to the broader community statewide. We honor the land itself and those who remain stewards of this land throughout the generations and also acknowledge our committed relationship to indigenous peoples. We gratefully recognize our history. Today's talk, front of the house, back of the house, race and inequality in the lives of restaurant workers is part of LAII's series on immigration and human rights, co-sponsored by the Maxwell Museum of Anthropology, the Alfonso Ortiz Center, and El Centro de la Raza. It's a great honor to introduce today's speaker. Uh, Eli Wilson is an assistant professor of sociology at the University of New Mexico. His research broadly examines how social inequality is both reproduced and contested in urban labor markets. Uh, his first book, Front of the House, Back of the House, Race and Inequality in the Lives of Restaurant Workers, was released through um, NYU Press in December of 2020 and is the topic of today's talk. Dr. Wilson's current project explores labor dynamics and cultural narratives about work in the U.S. craft beer industry. So please join me in welcoming Professor Wilson. <laughs> Thank you very much for that uh, introduction, Francis and Marlene, for having me. Um, it's an honor to be uh, to be with you all, and thank you, thank you for everyone atten in attendance. It is a Friday afternoon, and uh, I do recognize you all have uh, important things to get to, hopefully, for the weekend. Uh, I'm also joining uh, joining you all from the rather exotic location here of uh, across from Zimmerman Library. I think I see the duck pond out of the corner of my uh, my office. So. Um, these are strange times we're in, uh, to put it lightly. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And um, somebody do tell me if this isn't working. Okay. So um, once again, you know, Francis already uh, kind of introduced the title of this talk. It's, um, you know, as I'll explain today, it's coming from a long-term ethnographic project of mine, um, studying restaurant work in Los Angeles specifically. And because we are talking about restaurant work, and we are still in the middle of um, what I think is inarguably the greatest crisis the restaurant industry uh, has faced, being um, still in the throes of the pandemic. Uh, I do want to acknowledge that uh, it's, it's an unusual moment, again, to say the least, uh, to be talking about issues of inequality uh, within restaurants and among restaurant workers when the industry itself, uh, including its labor, labor force, is, um, is, has truly been decimated. In, in during this crisis. Um, I've written about this and, and I'm sure as you are uh, all aware at some level, um, this is an ongoing issue. Um, I think New Mexico as of February 10th just entered into the yellow tier. So there's sort of a, a, a trickle of life back into restaurants, but um, certainly not enough um, to, um, to, to bring everything back full swing. Um, in addition to that, you know, as I was reflecting on this, on this very, you know, this moment we're in for, for restaurant work, um, I, it also gave me a moment to reflect on the fact that even during the best of times, even during the golden age of which arguably the last 10 years has been uh, for restaurants in urban centers, um, restaurants, restaurant labor has been an absolute engine of social inequality. Uh, and I'm here to tell you uh, more about how indeed uh, these kinds of social inequities get reproduced uh, and produced within this setting. So just to give you a little bit of an overview of, of where we're headed, or uh, rather where uh, my recent book, uh, Front of the House, Back of the House, um, sort of the arc of the, of the book. Um, you know, we, what I'm gonna do in today's talk is I'm gonna focus mostly on uh, the first two chapters where I really build out this argument for uh, how we see the mechanisms of inequality, um, you know, sort of, you know, firing up, if you will, uh, within the setting. And that, that focuses uh, the first chapter um, on the role of management, the crucial role of management um, in reproducing this dynamic. Uh, and then the second 
chapter, which I'm going to spend the bulk of my time here today talking to you all about, uh, is really thinking about the role of workers themselves, their relationship, their dynamic within this workplace uh, that really seals what I call these two worlds of work apart, these two unequal worlds of work apart. Uh, now, later on in the book, um, which I'm happy to talk a little bit more about in the Q&A, um, I get into you know, this, the specific um, kinds of meaning, what, what restaurant work means to these different workers in the front and in the back. And then I end the book um, talking a little bit about um, sometimes unexpected ways that workers are able to get ahead in this environment. Uh, so just to give you a, a flavor for what, what uh, you know, is, is the meat of my recent book. Now, uh, I want to start with uh, just an overview of, of kind of beginning with this question of why study work? <laughs> uh, now, you know, as, as we reflect on this topic, um, work is something that so many of us spend the bulk of our lives doing. It's important for who we are in terms of our identity, and it's also crucially important for who we get to know, our social relations, and ultimately our access to different kinds of opportunities. Now, in addition to all that, uh, recent research um, is suggesting that workplaces are also key institutional settings where social inequalities and hierarchies get uh, reproduced and reproduced. Uh, and Joan Acker specifically is associated with um, the idea uh, that uh, in workplaces um, there exists what Acker calls inequality regimes. Uh, and I have the definition that she uses there um, on the slide. But this is part of a greater realization uh, among sociologists and, and really an interdisciplinary body of scholarship that we have to take place, uh, we have, sorry, we have to take uh, a greater consideration of the places where inequality uh, takes place and how those settings, organizational settings, institutional settings, workplaces uh, matter and matter greatly for um, the outcome that we're interested in. Now, usually in, in this body of, of literature, uh, literature, and I'm, I'm just sort of making a broad sweep here uh, for the sake of time, uh, the role of management uh, understandably looms large. Uh, so in a very kind of top-down sense, management plays a crucial role uh, in, in um, you know, sort of screening, playing a gatekeeping role in, um, in leading certain kinds of individuals into different types of jobs. Uh, there is a wealth of literature suggesting uh, discriminatory hiring based on uh, statuses of race, class, gender, and so forth. Uh, management, um, you know, maybe less explicitly, um, oftentimes relies on the notion of who fits what kind of job uh, in a way that's very difficult to capture and certainly goes beyond uh, what is formally listed on somebody's resume or their credentials. So. In, um, as research suggests, in much of the Southwest and other major centers, uh, manual labor, especially um, lower tiers of manual labor, are oftentimes socially coded for those who are foreign born. Um, Lisa Cantazarite has recently called this, um, you know, and used a racialized term uh, to talk about uh, this as brown collar labor, precisely thinking about the kind of coding based on race and foreign born status uh, for those um, lower status jobs in our, in our uh, workforce. Now, especially pertaining to restaurant labor, we can think about a very different type of job that also exists within these service establishments, uh, focused on customer service and idealizing people with um, a very different set of traits. Uh, and as uh, a wealth of, of uh, literature suggests, going all the way back to Arlie Hochschild and her seminal work on the managed heart, um, these types of jobs are oftentimes idealizing traits of middle classness, of whiteness, uh, and also oftentimes with a certain gender ideal in mind. Now, all of this literature, if I it could, could you know, bear with me to, to you know, make broad strokes here, <laughs> uh, all of this literature is primarily focused on what I like to call the front door, uh, the front door mechanisms of inequality. You know, in a gatekeeping fashion, we could think about who's let in and who's excluded from the workplace or who is, you know, systematically promoted uh, versus those who are denied those opportunities. Now, the, the, the crucial puzzle, the driving, you know, sort of puzzle of this project was as an ethnographer, I was interested in moving past that front door. I was interested in thinking about how do interpersonal dynamics, relationships between workers, workers and managers, uh, sometimes workers and customers, how does that crucially shape the way inequality gets manifested, reproduced, uh, and, and sometimes contested within this environment. 
Now, if we're interested in thinking about what goes on beyond the front door um, as a kind of mechanism of inequality, uh, conceptually, uh, uh, you know, something that is very useful to consider is this idea of boundary work um, that was popularized by uh, sociologist Michelle Lamont and, and her colleagues. Now, boundary work is a fun, it, it's a relational uh, process. And boundary work is fundamentally uh, a group making process. It's how we understand and we come to see us as different from uh, them um, and with a number of complexities. So what matters about boundary work too and what makes it so useful, especially for the kind of work that I do is how those boundaries uh, manifest on a symbolic level on, on one hand, but also uh, get, get used and enacted as a kind of closure or something Max Weber would call uh, social closure. Uh, now, what I'm gonna be focusing on here is that these boundaries don't simply exist sort of floating in space. Uh, they are deeply rooted in the kinds of environment where the kind of boundary work, relational work takes place. So in this case, we're paying attention to the organizational you know, structuring within restaurants uh, as a way that that informs this boundary making process. Okay, <laughs> so by way of summary, uh, on one hand, we are acknowledging and we're, we're considering how top down, you know, sort of vertical inequality works uh, in terms of managerial practices, right? What does management have to do with this dynamic of inequality we see? Uh, but more interesting for today's purposes is thinking about uh, within the front door, how does uh, intra-worker relations also contribute and reshape this type of inequality we see within restaurants? Now, for the questions that I'm asking here, particularly that second one, uh, this requires the tool set of an ethnographer, somebody who can go into that setting and see um, and, and see sort of deeply and experience what that workplace is like. So what I did, um, as a graduate student uh, who had who had time uh, time and resources uh, available for this endeavor was I spent six years uh, doing ethnographic research within three different um, higher end or what I call upscale restaurants in Los Angeles. This involved everything from looking for uh, looking for jobs, um, going through the hiring process and ultimately, um, you know, developing rapport and, and doing the things that ethnographers do to see this, uh, this field site firsthand. Um, I, in addition to this sort of firsthand work of which I, I or research rather, of which I served as a, uh, as a restaurant server um, in, in these three environments, I, I also uh, did 57 in-depth interviews with both workers and managers uh, and both individuals in the front of house and back of house. Uh, and while I was doing all this over the course of six years, uh, I was paying constant attention to different kinds of media publications, job postings, uh, and other kinds of industry, um, industry media. Now, because we're not in Los Angeles, I thought I'd give you all a little bit of background about what restaurants are like in Los Angeles. Uh, obviously, Los Angeles is well known for its Hollywood industry, sort of dominates, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the lore of Los Angeles, if you will. Uh, but you know, beyond that, uh, the food and beverage sector within Los Angeles is a major component of employment uh, in, in that region. Um, a little bit over, uh, according to recent statistics, um, a little over one out of 10 workers um, works in food and beverage in uh, LA County, uh, amounting to, you know, restaurants themselves amounting to $97 billion, uh, at least on a statewide level. Now, restaurant jobs themselves uh, are, are well known as sites where um, immigrants oftentimes work. Um, as I mentioned earlier in LA County, uh, these jobs are often racialized for uh, people of color and specifically in that region uh, as employment for, uh, for uh, Latino being a Mexican and Central American um, population. And if we look at some statistics of restaurant work more specifically in this area, we see that uh, one out of every two workers are indeed foreign born. Uh, and almost two and out of every three restaurant workers is Latino. And again, by Latino, uh, I'm focusing on uh, Mexican and Central American origin workers. Uh, 
For the sake of time, I'm going to skip past uh, talking in depth about my field sites, um, and I'm happy to do so in the Q&A. Needless to say, I was um, uh, I was studying three different restaurants, which I've given pseudonyms Nat, Wa, and uh, the neighborhood. Each of these restaurants was a higher end upscale restaurant, full service, so um, sort of categorically, um, you know, where customers would come in, um, be waited on by a server, um, and some of the more formalities of restaurant work. Uh, and in elsewhere in the book, I talk about how there was a subtle differences in what I call the service brands in each of these environments, with some implications uh, for what that meant for workers. Now, for the sake of this talk, I'm actually going to kind of skip beyond that and really going to be presenting on some of the commonalities uh, amongst all three restaurants. Now, because um, as, as I think all of us are aware, uh, restaurants are a very evocative place visually, you know, um, and certainly what's on the plate or, or in one's drink. So I thought I'd give you a little bit of a flavor of what these restaurants um, kind of look like and possibly feel like. Uh, so I have some kind of characteristic images um, of both the food and a little bit of the ambiance that we're seeing uh, in these types of workplaces. And I'll just go to the third one as well. And these are actually uh, footage um, uh, from the interior of those settings. Now, what's important to, to help us understand this, uh, my argument today a little bit uh, deeper, is actually the organization of restaurant work. Now, as many of you have, have, have heard, uh, restaurants are oftentimes characterized by a front of house and back of a house uh, distinction, organizational distinction, that is. Each of these uh, spheres of work, um, or what I call worlds of work within restaurants, are headed by different managerial teams. So in the dining room, you would have a general manager, possibly a maitre d', and uh, you know, dining room supervisors. In the kitchen would be headed by the chef, uh, head chef, um, sous chef, and so on and so forth. Now, the characteristic employees operating in these space, in the front of the house, that would be servers and bartenders, so guest facing, customer uh, serving positions. And in the back would be a series of cooks and cleaners um, that I can, I can talk a little bit more about. For, but for our purposes, line cooks, prep cooks, cleaners. Now, interestingly, there's always a team of workers that operates a bit more in between these spaces. Uh, in my book, I talk about this as support labor, uh, bussers, food runners, barbacks, um, and a few other positions that are sometimes customized per restaurant. Now, also important to know, uh, these are not just organizational distinctions, being front of house, back of house, and so forth, uh, but they come with a tremendous economic implication. Front of the house workers oftentimes make 20 to 30 plus dollars an hour in these environments, I should add, um, so this is certainly not a fast food or quick service uh, type of wage. Um, that, that is certainly not the case. Uh, support workers make less. And for our purposes here, thinking about the front of the house comparison with the back of the house, those workers in the back of the house average in LA somewhere between $10 and $14 an hour. Uh, before this talk today, I did a brief scan of New Mexico statistics, uh, and they seem to indicate that back of house workers here, because of the slightly lower minimum wage, make a little bit lower than the amount I have listed here on the slide. Now, some of you might be asking, why in the world is there such an economic divide? And the answer is it has everything to do with the way tips operate in this space. Uh, and for, for um, you know, to, to be brief about tips, most tips, the lion's share of tips, um, are garnered by front of the house workers. Uh, some of those tips get trickled down to the support staff. That's what's called tipping out in restaurant speak. And finally, most back of the house workers don't make any tips at all. So again, the, the tipping is a major reason why there's an economic consequence in terms of who works what job. Now, briefly, um, I also should point out that um, there is also some very important social distinctions in terms of who is in what position. Front of the house staff, disproportionately white, combination of men and women, at least in this setting, uh, tend to be young and of higher human capital, uh, mostly captured by um, having college degrees, for instance. In the back of the house, um, as I've previously mentioned, a kind of racialized uh, so-called brown collar labor. Uh, these are, are overwhelmingly, at least in Los Angeles, uh, Mexican and Central Americans, both immigrants and the children of immigrants um, or second generation. Uh, their age range is a little bit wider uh, and compared to the front of the house, they are lower in human capital. 
Now, now that I've laid out um, uh, you know, sort of these broad overviews, uh, now we can dig into what it is that I actually uh, found in my study related to what seals these two worlds of work with three different uh, social characteristics and economic um, kind of implications. And uh, I'm going to present uh, this first section rather briefly um, so we can spend a lot of time talking about workers themselves. Uh, but it is crucial to understand the role that management plays in what I call producing this divide. And they do so in ways that we might expect by uh, differences in hiring uh, strategies um, for one. So what I have here is um, an example of the kinds of questions that I myself, given some of my social characteristics, my in in restaurants was uh, to the front of house. I, and these were questions that I was asked uh, when going through the hiring process. Um, and I have and I, I won't read all of them, but for instance, I'll focus on that first bullet point. Uh, describe your last visit to a fine dining restaurant. So again, this is a question posed by management. Um, and what management really wants to know here is not um, what was your experience like working in fine dining. Uh, that what they really want to know is what was your experience as a customer, or as all my managers wanted me to say, as a guest, right? So it requires uh, somebody who is coming from uh, the circumstance that they have dined and oftentimes frequently in these environments such that they are familiar and comfortable to answer that kind of question. Now on the right hand side of your screen, or at least on my right hand side, uh, we see a kind of a job uh, advertisement. Um, now this was not taken from one of the three restaurants that I was uh, working within, but it was a nearby restaurant, um, particularly close to Match restaurant. And we can see in terms of the characteristics being described uh, that they're looking for a certain kind of individual, somebody who uh, these characteristics being cool and eco-friendly and, and, you know, a variety of ways that they describe this. This is the kind of person uh, that's going to that these types of front of house jobs are going to resonate with. Uh, and I always find it kind of interesting that um, they're, they're sort of looking for this kind of person and all for the purpose of serving a rather humble food being empanadas. Now, as we would imagine, in the back of house, we see a very different kind of racialized and classed hiring screening. Uh, we see, for instance, taking directly from Craigslist, uh, one particular restaurant that I've changed the name for, for privacy, uh, is looking to hire a dishwasher and the characteristics that they're looking for are very telling, right? They say that they're looking for someone who is fast, neat, bilingual, multitask, and organized. Well, it doesn't take um, someone with a high, higher degree to figure out that uh, it's not necessary to be bilingual. And, you know, might I add that this is really the, the implied is bilingual English Spanish. It doesn't take somebody bilingual to be able to wash dishes, yet that is precisely who they expect to be reading these ads and to be responding back to them. Now, on the right hand side of the screen, another kind of uh, in this sense, um, I think we could call this blatantly discriminatory hiring. Um, and to run through this quickly in the upper ad, again, this is posted on a restaurant um, kind of front facade. On the upper uh, hand, it says that the restaurant's looking for both kitchen staff and servers. On the bottom um, ad, and oops, I can't, oh, there we go. <laughs> we see that uh, um, in Spanish, um, this ad is only looking for those who would work in the back of house. So again, we're thinking about who is going to be reading what sign. And um, of course, in the lower sign written in Spanish, uh, it conspicuously absent is um, hiring a front of house staff as well. Okay. Sorry, my screen. There we go. Okay. <laughs> uh, and these kinds of differences, um, you know, uh, that, that management imparts upon the workplace, uh, they also follow deeper into the workplace into how supervising um, occurs within restaurants. Um, now, none of these, uh, none of what I, what I have here list, listed on the slide alone would be thought of as uh, a tremendous, tremendously sort of discriminatory uh, or ex exploitative uh, managerial process, but coupled with uh, what we previously noted about racializing class hiring screening people into these different positions. The fact that, for instance, staff notices are written in different languages. When it's a front of the house, uh, you know, or matter, organizational matter, it's presented only in English. 
when it's a back of house matter, uh, sometimes only in Spanish or, you know, some charitably, if you will, uh, in both English and Spanish. Um, similarly, when staff meetings occur, uh, they are clearly divided into groups of front of the house and back of the house workers. Um, there's very little over, you know, over the course of my research, I was uh, attended very few, um, you know, sort of staff meetings that were presented as all staff. So again, when managers talk about, um, you know, we, we are all working as a team, uh, it really begs the question that, that who's part of that team? And really what I found is it's, it's, it's much more apt to talk about two different and unequal teams uh, within these environments. Now, moving beyond management, um, I want to focus on uh, what, how workers experience this space. As we previously noted, workers are channeled into these different types of jobs and thus their social characteristics, as well as their, uh, their, their economic resources and a number of other characteristics differ. But what does that look like and feel like um, in the workplace? And ultimately, what does this have to tell us about inequality? Now, the first thing I want to mention is that for workers, there is oftentimes a profound disconnect between those situated in the front and those situated in the back. And the easiest, we can just start with the easiest measure of this of all, which is who knows whose name. <laughs> it was very clear across every restaurant I worked at that while um, servers and bartenders, for instance, um, knew, you know, was on a first name basis with their, their coworkers in that setting, uh, they oftentimes did not know a single name in the kitchen. They might know the chef's name. Um, and by the way, chef, I'm making a distinction between regular cooks and chefs, which are often more credentialed and also disproportionately white, um, white and educated as well. Uh, but nonetheless, um, there was a, there was a profound disconnect, and that disconnect also uh, happened in in inverse. Being people in the back of house, oftentimes were had very chummy relations, first name basis, knew their families. It's all the things that you would associate with a close knit work team. But when I asked some of these individuals uh, to you know what their relations were like with with others up front the serving and bartending staff uh, the name recognition completely stopped cold uh, oftentimes they would point uh, they would point to somebody who is uh, waiting a table and talk about the the blonde the girl with the blonde hair or the guy the guy who's tall and skinny right so it was that degree of disconnect um, even on the basis of a name and i have a brief example here of nathan bombi both of who are servers um, in uh, Tewa, and both of them were talking about uh, who are they working with? Who are they running with uh, tonight? They just wanted to know a simple question. And Bobby's response, uh, he tells Nathan, it's you, me, Eli, Peggy, and two S's. And S in this context, I know in some other contexts it has gang connotations. Uh, Bobby, what really Bobby's talking about is he's like, it's like saying, well, two dudes. But of course, these dudes are also in racialized form. It's not just um, you know, two random individuals. It's two people, they're not given a name, and uh, there's also that racial uh, component there uh, to who would be working those jobs. Now, similarly, what, what I wanna you know, Im impress upon you all is just how much uh, the physical proximity of working in a small restaurant workplace uh, and yet being so profoundly divided, structurally divided, socially divided, that impacts workers in thinking about each other and in their relations with each other. So in this particular field note, uh, and let me see if I can, see if I can move this enough. Uh, I'll go ahead and read this off. We pass the kitchen heading towards the rear exit after our shift. Charlie, who's a white man, whoops about his cash tips and does a playful little jig. Let's hit the bars, baby, cries George, who's also a white man. I say galley today. Now, I noticed as we passed by that in the kitchen, Zeno and Juan, who are both Mexican immigrants, uh, glanced up at us, expressionless. They were hunched over cutting boards. And they returned very quickly to sharpening their, their personal knives as we headed out the door. Now, what was striking is later I came back and I talked to Zeno and Juan um, about that about that moment. And I learned very quickly uh, and frankly, embarrassingly, given that I was with George and Charlie going off to this bar called Galley, that they were both heading, they were sharpening their knives because they were heading to second jobs, second cooking jobs for the night shift. Uh, 
So what we have here, you know, very evocative metaphor would be that we have two different cohorts of workers that are heading in literally the opposite direction. One is going off to play after work, the other is going uh, to continue uh, to labor. And again, this impresses uh, upon workers as they start to understand how it is that they're similar to some individuals and different from others in a workplace that is not all that, uh, not all that large to begin with. So uh, another example of this is a cook named Rodrigo, who is uh, a second generation uh, Salvadoran man. And Cook was talking, I'm sorry, Rodrigo was talking about uh, different members of the front of the house from his point of view. And so what he says is some of these servers, they make really random requests. And I said, like what? Rodrigo says, uh, Jeremy, he'll, he'll ring in these stupid ass mods. And that's his word for modifications on food tickets. And then at the same time, he will just be kind of standing there. And that goes for Jeremy and Lorraine, who's a white woman. Uh, they'll both be there chilling and talking to each other. And I say, and you'll see this out of your corner of your eye? And he says, no, not out of the corner of my eye. It'll be right there in front of us. They'll be pulling out their phones, checking their messages or whatever. And I'm like, what the fuck? I'm getting yelled at and this fucker makes more money than me. So I'm just like, what the fuck? So excuse my language. Uh, but this shows you, you know, just how much somebody like Rodrigo, who's cooking uh, in the kitchen, it's, it's, it's hot and he, he's sweating and he's seeing his coworkers no more than 10 feet from him. Uh, and he's making sense of, uh, even without talking to them, he's making sense of how, um, of their relationship uh, as a function of their different positions. Now, as you can imagine, uh, this oftentimes manifests in a kind of interpersonal tension. Um, as the previous examples I've already given uh, should certainly give you, uh, give you a hint that uh, relations that cross the front of house, back of house, as well as race and class lines are oftentimes very tense in this environment. And this can lead to some misunderstandings. Um, in fact, I would, I would argue this easily leads to near daily misunderstandings. Uh, an example of this would be a situation from Tewa, uh, of which Tina, who's a white woman and a server, uh, was complained about two dishwashers named Gregorio and Jesus. Uh, and she said that they were, quote, talking shit about her in Spanish. Now, interestingly, Tina doesn't speak Spanish, so a lot of this is uh, as <laughs> her kind of um, th thinking about the situation rather than knowing. Now, when the floor manager failed to intercede, Tina refused to enter the dish area for the rest of the night. By the way, that is part of her job. She has to drop off plates uh, to be clean. And she avoided specifically contact with these two men. And I was there that night, and I can tell you firsthand, this created a tremendous uh, um, you know, turmoil, I would say, uh, for those of us in the front of the house. Uh, we basically had to do her job for her. Uh, Tina almost got fired for the situation. Uh, but what I want to pay attention to here is later on, I went back and I talked to Gregorio about this situation. Uh, and Gregorio threw up his hands and he said, that girl, referring to Tina, she's crazy. Now, again, what I want to emphasize here is just how much small issues, small tensions, misunderstandings, if you will, become balloon into greater issues, character judgments, uh, and sometimes very disruptive uh, forces within the workplace. Now, just to not, um, you know, give you the impression that this, these kinds of tensions always manifest and this becomes a, uh, you know, a sort of a, a hair pulling environment to, to be part of day in and day out. Uh, other kinds of relations can also indicate uh, not only the social differences apparent, but also a kind of implicit social hierarchy at play. Uh, and sometimes these, these different types of relationships uh, aren't tense at all. So uh, I'll give you an example here, and this is coming from the neighborhood. Uh, and this was an interaction uh, that would occur very often, a couple times a week, I would say, uh, between Juan, who's a Mexican immigrant man, and also a busser, uh, and Rachel, who's a white woman and a server. And one approach, uh, here's from my field notes, one approaches the service area uh, where Rachel and I are standing, and she calls out Juanito in exaggerated tone. I missed you so much. He says, what's up, mama, replies Juan. The two of them hug and they hold the position. Now turning towards me, Juan smirks and she says, she's gonna be my wife, you know. Rachel giggles and she rolls her eyes. And like I said, this would occur, this was a, this was a frequent kind of performative dynamic uh, within their relationship. Now, what I, what I, what I, 
some context is kind of important to understand what's going on here. Uh, Rachel doesn't interact this way with any of her peers in the front of the house who are, who are both white women uh, and also um, several white men um, in which she is never this chummy with them. She's never uh, overtly hugging them. Uh, and they certainly don't talk about the fact that they're going to uh, marry uh, Rachel. Um, so there's something about the, uh, the the performative nature of this relationship. I got the impression, uh, my read on this situation is that Juan was quite serious in, in thinking about the possibility of romance between him and Rachel. Uh, but for Rachel, this was this was just a, a, you know kind of a banter between them, um, and and nothing more. So again, uh, kind of symbolizing and normalizing the kind of hierarchies apparent within this space. Now, some of the more uh, striking examples to me of the way workers interact and how that shapes processes of inequality are thinking about individuals who try to cross between the back of the house world uh, and front of house uh, jobs and spaces. And two examples I wanna draw your attention to. Uh, the first would be Henry. And Henry was uh, an immigrant uh, Mexican man who was a server um, that I worked alongside for the duration of my, my time, uh, in this case, at the neighborhood. And uh, when I talked to Henry, he told me that he had been a busser as well as a cook for about 10 years prior to making the jump. So clearly, uh, it was a, a long and laborious struggle to get him to the position where he was um, a full-blown uh, server in this restaurant. Now, what was fascinating to me is Henry told me that after he made that jump, he was immediately thrust into tension, not with the white cohort, the colleagues, if you will, in the front of house, but with his co-ethnic peers and former colleagues in the back of house. And uh, one example uh, that he, he told me was the very first uh, day he went to uh, collect his tips, which is something done by uh, every, every uh, front of house worker. Um, some of the cooks came up to him afterwards and they reached out their palm and he, he kind of indicated like this. And, and um, Henry said that his coworkers told him, well, where's my share? Now, consider that uh, servers don't usually tip out cooks, uh, but what they were saying was, you're one of us, where's my share, right? So share those tips. So Henry talked, um, he said he struggled for a long time about his new role as a server amongst a uh, predominantly white, um, you know, white colleagues in that space. Uh, that cr uh, created new kinds of tensions with the people he used to work with uh, in the back of house. Now, Enrique's situation was a little different. When I worked with uh, Enrique, who is also a Mexican immigrant man, uh, Enrique was a food runner, uh, which is part of that support staff. Uh, but when I sat down and interviewed him and got to know him a little better, he told me that he used to be a server. And in fact, briefly, he was even a manager in the front of house. Uh, again, there would been there was no there was no one. Um, he, he would have been one of the very few that was not uh, a white man or woman in that capacity. Now, what Henry, oh, sorry, what Enrique said about that experience was that uh, although he longed for years to, to you know, gain that stature and, and the kind of money and resources that come with it, uh, upon doing so, he was immediately thrust into an environment that was uncomfortable for him. He felt stressed by having to respond to concerns both coming from his, uh, his colleagues on the server staff, as well as the affluent, predominantly white customers uh, or guests uh, that operated in that space. So constantly having to navigate what Elijah Anderson calls white space was exceedingly difficult for him. And uh, you know, proof in the pudding that by the time I met Enrique, Enrique had returned willingly to a, a, a food running position. He said he asked management to step down. So again, thinking about the way these boundaries, racializing class boundaries play out for workers themselves as they experience this environment. Now, the last uh, thing I want to uh, talk about is um, thinking about the boundary work between different types of workers. Uh, it became very apparent that um, members of the front of house talked about us, who we were, how we feel and relate to our job differently uh, than they would characterize them being back of house uh, workers with the whole racial and class uh, connotation. Now, two, uh, two quotes, uh, um, in fact, I'll just go ahead and read the first one. Uh, Alexandra, who is a white woman and a server, um, a longtime server, uh, she says that I enjoy hospitality, you know, it's a real art, but do I want to stay a waitress my whole life? Hell no. Now, uh, related to that, 
um, the distinction of, you know, do I or do we want to be doing this our whole lives and the rejection of that identity as a restaurant worker is something that um, Morgan, for instance, in the bottom quote, uh, does in fact characterize as uh, the, the attitude that she perceives amongst back of house workers. For them, this is a career. I just wanna do this for a little while and make my money and get out. But for them, they treat this job very differently. And we see in the back of house, uh, a similar kind of boundary making, symbolic boundary making, social boundary making being done. Uh, front of house workers are unilaterally perceived as lazy gringos. This has fascinating implications, by the way, for the very for the the several uh, Latino um, front of house workers uh, that were operating in that space. Oftentimes, there was a kind of judgment of those individuals as well, uh, much like Henry's uh, experience that I mentioned just a little bit ago. Uh, and Rodrigo, uh, the cook I introduced earlier, his, his, um, his take on front of house was telling. He says, I'm sorry, but you guys can't do what we do. The shit that I've gone through in the past, the thing is no one or no thing at the restaurant bothers me at all. Uh, a grown man screaming at me about a food ticket, that's nothing. But I've seen other people kind of wilt under this pressure. And by other people, he was eyeing my colleagues in the front of house. So it's very clear who those other people are. Um, and it's interesting how Rodrigo also ascribes a kind of masculinity, a kind of pride with uh, doing this kind of work and doing it well and doing it better than he perceives that um, his front of house coworkers would do. So now what, we're, what we've seen here is uh, the way in which workers themselves, their relationships, their tensions, their estrangement, end up uh, dividing uh, and reinforcing racialized and class boundaries in this environment. It makes it exceedingly difficult for workers who are uh, positioned in, um, in the subordinate, uh, invisible back of house jobs to make the entree into the front of house, even if management allows them to. And there are some instances in this book that I recount uh, where management indeed was willing to let certain, um, certain you know, uh, immigrant and second generation Latino men make entree into front of house, and yet there were barriers still. And so what I'm emphasizing here is the fact that to really understand the mechanisms of inequality, the interlocking mechanisms, we need to pay attention both to the organizational distinctions, uh, most of the time structured by management, and the way those distinctions play out and become internalized as worker qualities and maybe more importantly, worker uh, differences and hierarchies. So what I have here, and I won't spend too much time on this slide, I have here some of the structural features, structural distinctions between front and back of house. Uh, and lower in the second part of the slide, um, you know, I, I've just created a simple kind of binary in how workers themselves start to make sense of both who they are and who they are not as a function of the environment that they're positioned within. And I can go back to the slide uh, if, in the Q&A if you all are interested. So just to reiterate the main points, what are we learning here? Uh, part of what this book arguments, uh, argues in terms of a contribution of how we understand inequality in these kinds of everyday service environments of which restaurants are not the only one, where is, is it's the distinct coupling of intra-worker relations with managerial practices that ultimately makes uh, inequality so durable, to use Charles Tilley's uh, language about inequality. And workers themselves end up enacting racialized and class boundaries that close off those divided worlds, uh, despite the fact that uh, we should recall that restaurants are you know, fairly intimate environments. They're not big sprawling workplaces. Um, oftentimes these jobs don't, uh, are not controlled by formal credentials like one might think of uh, in other kinds of professional work environments. So the fact that workers, um, you know, the, the stuff, the everyday stuff that they do and say and think uh, matter for how we understand this hierarchy and uh, what holds it in place. And so specifically, we're understanding a kind of stratification that goes on within um, restaurants. What I talked about earlier is the engine of inequality within these kinds of spaces. Now, one thing I wanna pay attention to, um, the, uh, you know, in addition to these very clear kind of racial and class inequalities here, uh, is the fact that, um, as I detail later in, in, in the book, um, be precisely because the boundaries between front and back of house that are also racialized in class, because those boundaries are so powerful and distinct, there are unexpected ways 
in which um, primarily second generation Latino men in this environment could sometimes leverage those boundaries to their advantage such that they could use the fact that these cohorts of workers are so divided uh, as a tool to help themselves get ahead in this space, sometimes brokering interactions between these, uh, these cohorts and helping management essentially uh, knit together what is otherwise an intensely divided environment. So again, I talk a little bit more about um, these sort of situated advantages um, in uh, a later chapter in my book. So on that note, thank you all for uh, paying attention and I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing um, what you, you know, your, your thoughts and fielding questions. Thank you, Eli, for that wonderful presentation. So yes, if anyone wants to ask any questions, we're welcome to open it up in the chat or if you want to just unmute yourself and ask, God, feel free. Hi, I have a question. Can you hear me? Hi, I'm, I'm Rebecca Kitson. Um, I'm an immigration uh, adjunct immigration professor here at the law school and also an immigration um, practitioner in the, in the state. And it's kind of, I was so excited to hear you talk and it's, I'm thrilled about your work. I did um, 15 years in the restaurant business myself before I became an immigration attorney and it actually was the reason that I chose the career path that I have. I'm just given all of the reasons that you stated. And I'm just kind of curious how um, documented and you know undocumented um, individuals, how that plays into some of the dynamics. And if that was something that you discussed with people, if that was something that they shared with you, um, you know, just of course as as part of that overall power dynamic. So should I go ahead and respond? Yeah. Rebecca, thank you. Thank you for the question. It's it's a really really important one. Um, you know, from from a certain perspective, it seems uh, inconceivable that I could go through fifty minutes of presentation and not talk about documentation uh, within restaurant labor. Um, so I have, a, I have a couple thoughts on that. Um, you know, later in the book, I do talk about um, you know different kinds of of power hierarchies, and and I, I use a very intersectional lens here in thinking about cumulative sources of advantage and disadvantage. Um, I talk about uh, within the strata of the back of house, within this racialized class, uh, predominantly foreign born uh, sort of sphere of labor, uh, I talk about the hierarchies apparent within that environment. And it became very clear to me that those uh, that I call uh, stuck in the back closet, uh, and that's literally in the lowest positions, the most invisible positions, uh, were individuals who are disproportionately undocumented, um, along with, uh, uh, there was a disproportionate amount of women, for instance, in these very low tier positions. We're talking cleaning positions, dishwashing, uh, with very little access to uh, some, some of the um, ability to make mobility jumps within this space. Um, now, so in that sense, a, a lack of documentation status does matter. It matters in subtle ways. It, it leads to greater likelihood of exploitation and everything you'd imagine. Now, I will say though, in another, from another point of view, uh, restaurants are such, are so famously, notoriously the wild west in terms of undocumented employment that what also is very true is that some of the um, immigrant Latino men that were able to get ahead, make small jumps, become line cooks, uh, sort of uh, make their way just below um, the, the level of sous chefs and, and chefs, sort of the managerial tier of the kitchen. Uh, some of those individuals were also undocumented. And um, the way that I sort of argue in the book and make sense of that is that they were able to display, um, you know, a kind of a, a, a lived experience skill set within kitchens within a space uh, that there were a disproportionate amount of undocumented workers. Uh, they were able to show, you know, sort of situated skills that allowed them a degree of mobility. Uh, so, you know, I think that there's sort of two sides to look at the question of, of documentation and restaurant work, but it's a, it's a great issue. Eli Krista has a question and she says, um, do you think there are policies that could help mitigate the inequality, such as requiring share tips with back of house too? Yeah, thank you, Krista. Um, you know, I, I, I suppose to, to wade a bit into the political sphere, I think that in general, uh, you know, the Trump era was, um, was terrible. 
for uh, for many of uh, you know, the people that I got to know in the back of house um, created a lot of fear, uh, a lot of questions about do I do I stay in the states? Uh, do I take my family back? Questions that you would you know concerns and questions you would expect. Um, one one interesting silver lining to the Trump era and Trump era policies uh, is that uh, his administration amended uh, the labor standards laws to actually allow. Uh, I believe in 2018 or 2019, um, I'd have to go back and check my notes, allowing the sharing of tips between front and back of house. Uh, this was kind of a uh, low key groundbreaking change uh, in the industry, precisely for the kinds of economic hierarchies that I spelled out. Uh, so just to reiterate, back when I was working um, and, and researching restaurants, uh, there was a clear, we don't tip out the kitchen. And there was that was not only a norm, but that was a legal structure. You could only tip out people and share tips with people that are in the direct line of service. You had to be interacting with customers in some way to garner tips. Uh, the Trump administration changed that policy uh, to allow more flexibility restaurant on a restaurant by restaurant basis to be able to distribute tips uh, however restaurants see fit. Now, besides, uh, you know, on a practical note, <laughs> because of the power dynamic that I spoke of today, uh, that doesn't mean that cooks are going to be having the same access to tips that we would imagine the predominantly white, um, more class privileged, uh, you know, front of house uh, tends to have. But it does uh, start to rectify some of that economic uh, dis disparity, uh, I'll say potentially, <laughs> rather than, um, you know, a definite statement. Um, just to briefly address the issue of policies, you know, I, I've, uh, you know, spent a long time thinking about, you know, uh, at, at a basic level, how would I set up restaurants differently? Uh, knowing that these issues are apparent. And uh, within the space, you know, I think there's a lot more macro structural change that needs to happen, that needs to be reckoned with. But within this kind of organizational space, uh, what became very clear to me is that we need uh, greater access to training and advancement opportunities. Uh, and the reason I say that is that I worked with countless hardworking, say, bussers, cooks, sometimes even dishwashers, uh, who were extremely motivated to make restaurants their career. They were proud of what they did. They loved the restaurant. Uh, arguably, they were more committed to the restaurant than many of the front of house sort of you know, white privileged workers that I worked with. And yet they were being denied access both by management and then of course informally uh, by the kinds of dynamics that I spoke of today. Uh, and, and as a result, they were stuck. They were quite literally stuck in subordinate roles. And so uh, what I would advocate is a much more explicit, formalized way in which those who are in lower tier jobs, maybe entry level positions, uh, can gain access to training and mentorship to help them rise up in, in the restaurant ranks and possibly opening up avenues to, to management as well. So we definitely need those structures uh, in place. And currently, that is absolutely not the case in the majority of um, higher tier restaurants. I do have a question, if possible. Hi, Eli, first and foremost, uh, thank you for this. I appreciate that. It's it it well, uh, it well researched. I'm Farnon Darnell. I teach over at CNM um, at Sociology. I have for a few, and first of all, just to have a comment and then I have a question. I did used to teach, when I teach social problems, I'd have my students talking about race and inequality go to their restaurants to even fast food and keep journals to see what was actually the front of the house with you who the cooks were, who the manager was, and, think, and those dynamics and interactions that would happen from their perspective as customer, in fact, but also seeing the, 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 those racial inequalities that were coming through. So I appreciate this very much because that's what, exactly what I've been trying to get to my students is this better understanding. The question I do have, and we're talking about policy, so I guess I'll piggyback on that is, do you see any implications? Because we know that A, restaurants have a high turnover, but we also have a, have a stereotype of um, they being the, the example when it comes to the minimum wage and what that means for the, uh, how it's gonna affect a, a single mom minimum wage working as a waitress, whatever it is. Do you see any um, uh, advantages or disadvantages either way of, of course, talks right now are increasing, the, increasing that, that wage slowly in the, in the next four years, up to $15 an hour, hopefully it'll go through. It should be higher, we know that, but anyway. Do you see any advantages or disadvantages of that happening, in fact, and how that would impact, I don't know about, I don't know about so much of the overall industry, but them as employees and how it would impact front of the house, back of the house, if any way at all? 
anyway, um, that's not a question. Thank you. Yeah, that's 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 a great question. Um, yeah, I mean, just to be very clear, I I think that you know restaurants are such notoriously low wage uh, employment settings that a, a rise in minimum wage is something we all have to advocate for. It's going to directly benefit uh, those that are that are clearly being exploited um, with racial connotations, you know, you know, and and so on and so forth. So um, I have absolutely no, um, you know, I'm completely in, in favor of that. Um, I also think it, it serves more, um, it, it also functions on a symbolic level. You know, w one thing that I, I started to pay a lot of attention to in thinking about the narratives, the narratives that, that workers would use to talk about uh, how they make sense of this type of labor. Um, I think another level of wound beyond the economic, um, you know, what, what Bourdieu might call a, a kind of symbolic violence enacted on, on workers is the fact that this was uh, such degraded labor. They were making such little money. There was, it was almost impossible to take this, to treat themselves as professionals. Um, and that I would say was, was something uh, you know, apparent in the kitchen because that's such a, a low wage setting. It's also apparent in the front of house. Um, you know, one of the biggest critiques of, if, of our tip labor system is that it, it completely, uh, you know, denigrates that type of work uh, as professional. Um, it, it, it's impossible to think of you saw those quotes I, I gave from um, two of those, uh, my, my server colleagues, they just don't consider themselves um, restaurant workers. It's impossible to that's that's not something that somebody particularly from a middle class standing would ever want to uh, have that attribution unless, of course, you're a chef or a restaurateur. Um, so I, I, I think I've gone off topic here, but uh, I'm, I'm definitely in favor of, of the rise. I think it's only going to do good things for disparity and also for that sense of professionalism. Carter, I see your hands up. Um, yes, it is. Hello. Thank you, Marlene. Um, hello to everyone, but especially to Marlene and to Dr. Hayashida, who I've ever, never actually met. So thanks to you both for your recent advice and, and counsel. Um, Eli, thank you so much. This is a fascinating topic. Um, I could literally ask you a million questions, but I'll keep it as, as short as possible. Um, so my name is Carter Barnwell. I'm a doctoral candidate in the history department at the UNM. Um, currently talking to you from Portland where it's snowing like gangbusters as, as you may be able to see. Um, so in my previous life, I worked for 30 years in restaurants, uh, the last 26 as a bartender, and most of those years in New York City. Um, I wanted to say, uh, I, I was hoping that you include a caveat in your book that, that there are perhaps a dozen counter examples to, to many of the examples given um, based on city and uh, cultures and in other places. Um, but that that's um, not what I wanted to ask you, but I, I wanted to tell you, um, I was thinking of many things during your talk and mostly because everyone I know is having a conversation right now about what happens next, what am I qualified to do, what, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so my, I wanted to, to ask you, um, because you hit on something very important about the restaurant industry, that it's going through this massive crisis, perhaps the worst in its history, um, at a moment when we have also lost some of our, our traditional you know, intellectuals um, in, in Los Angeles, especially the, the wonderful restaurant critic, Jonathan Gold passed away. He's been a great voice um, for, the, for the industry. Um, Anthony Bourdain on a more international scale, a terrific writer and producer, everyone knows him, et cetera. These are voices of, of reason, of guidance for, for everyone in the industry. And, and they're suddenly gone at this moment. Um, so I'm wondering how you see your own work. I mean, I'd be interested to know who, who is publishing your book? How are they promoting it? Do you intend to have some sort of a crossover appeal in your audience? Um, and, and I know that's a, a whole bunch of questions in one, but if you could talk to that briefly, I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Carter. Uh, and you know that that's that's really excellent that you you know you got to bounce uh, what I'm what I'm saying on a conceptual level with your personal experience, which is always like, you know, always makes it more real and you know and, and so on and so forth. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I think I'm on the record, you know, talking about just how profound this this crisis has been, and that it's played out differently. Uh, the pandemic, that is, it's played out differently for workers in different positions. Um, you know, early on, I think in March, I penned a piece, um, you know, that I think it was an op-ed published in an LA-based LA 
uh, magazine, um, thinking about you know the the fact that um, undocumented workers um, were not didn't have access to uh, some of the state and, and government funded aid. Um, so at a time when their work was shriveling up, hours were being cut and reduced. Uh, they really had nowhere to turn. They had no safety net, and that was um, that was a real crisis. I was in touch with um, several families that I used to work with as a function of this uh, this research, um, and they were there was a genuine fear about what next. They were being left behind yet again, but in a, in a way where they they just had nowhere to turn in the pandemic. Um, you know, in other in other areas of restaurant work. Uh, relatively speaking, um, I think at this point it is clear that front of house workers, those who rely intensively on tips, are the ones whose lives have been profoundly upended. Uh, no customer, like like your your former self, I think uh, I don't know if you're still working in, as a bartender, but the fact that the, there are no tips, there are no shifts. These are these are schedules that usually, you know, I mean, you probably well remember shifts that are open ended. They don't you know have a closing hour, but they're based on customer traffic. Well, all of that is gone. So now what, right? So as the as food you know as the food service industry moves to delivery, takeout platforms, etc., um, you know, it's having disparate in, impacts on these different workers. Uh, and I might I add that um, higher end full service restaurants are 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 disproportionately uh, this is catastrophic for, for that specifically. You know, if you're if you're a quick serve, you're you know, Burger King, even even Denny's, you can pivot, especially if you have resources. Uh, full service restaurants, uh, upscale restaurants are are <laughs> you know they're, they're in hibernation in the worst possible sense, and everyone employed within them. So um, I, I, again, as I mentioned in the beginning, this is an absolutely unprecedented and, and tragic time. Um, vaccine can't come soon enough. Uh, Eli, Maida asks, do you know what the percentage of Latino managers are and if they face discrimination since customers might expect a white manager? Mm. Yeah, that's a great issue. Um, short answer, I'll be honest, I don't know. Um, I don't know any reliable statistics, uh, both in New Mexico or or in in California, uh, that capture that. But I, I, that's wonderful, and I, I would be a, it'd be a tremendous public service uh, to to be able to to, to have that breakdown by by race. Um, you know, I, I will say something I talk a little bit about um, is you know this idea of of what I call in betweenness, this kind of uh, situational advantage of those who are able to broker different um, unequal cohorts within the restaurant. And um, there were some, you know, LA born uh, Mexican and Central American uh, men, and I believe one woman, if I have to go back to my data check, uh, who were able to access uh, positions as floor managers and as lead servers and bartenders. And they did so precisely by being able to talk to different uh, cohorts by being able to sometimes translate uh, in a linguistic sense, but also in a social and cultural sense. Uh, so unlike uh, the example I gave of Enrique, who is an uh, immigrant, he was from Oaxaca, and he um, he really struggled to sort of navigate uh, what I called white space. Um, you know, some of the LA born, you know, LA, uh, you know, sort of US educated, uh, bilingual, you know, second generation, they had a different experience. And, and some of that was of, of lingering racial um, you know, discrimination. Um, and others was a bit more of a silver lining in terms of, of the positions that they were able to access within the restaurant industry. Um, so I hope I touched on your question. Um, I would say there's, there's a little more complexity there. Francis, you wanna go ahead with your question? Hey, Eli, um, thanks so much. That was really great talk. Um, I just wanted to know if you if you saw that there's a very recent study out. It's still just in preprint um, by uh, UC San Francisco researchers that document the um, the excess mortality. So the people who have been most what the professions that have been most impacted um, with and you know with the most people dying with the COVID epidemic. And number one is cooks, and then somewhere eight or nine is chefs, and then you know, they do the top 25 and bartenders are, I think, 20 something um, front of the house. The other, you know, wait servers are not um, on that list or somewhere, you know, also affected, but it's 
uh, you know, really it's the back of the house folks that have been disproportionately also affected by the pandemic. And so they've been making recommendations that this might also affect things like uh, vaccine priority, you know, who's most vulnerable. So I don't know, you know, if you've, if you've thought about that, about the, you know, the disproportionate effects of the pandemic. Yeah, that's, that's a great point, Francis. Um, you know, I, I think that that is very consistent with what I would have predicted. Um, you know, I, I've, I've published work that has suggested that um, you know front of house workers who tend to be of you know various kinds of so social and economic privilege, um, you know they, in addition to their social background, um, a lot of them have a much looser linkage to uh, the idea of, of their identity as a restaurant worker and their commitment to working in the industry long term. Uh, what that means in it in this time of crisis is that uh, while job loss has been profound, and by the way, there, there are clearly exceptions to this rule uh, that I also talk about elsewhere in the book, uh, but for uh, many of my coworkers who, again, tenuous ties to the restaurant industry and resources that allow them a kind of mobility, uh, within the labor market, uh, they they have been, uh, I would say, uh, and I would predict, I don't have data to back this up, they're probably in a better position to pivot to different types of jobs that might be available. Uh, recall that many of these individuals, at least in my study, were college educated. So they have, you know, a hard credential, if you will, that allows them to sort of survey other, other opportunities. Um, I'm not you know, that is, I, don't get me wrong, I think it's still sad that they're being forced to do that. And certainly being a restaurant per worker could be part of uh, an important part of their identity. Uh, but I, I think that we see their ability to to pivot more effectively. Uh, and speaking to your issue, it's, un, it's not surprising to me uh, that those who are not able to pivot and uh, are oftentimes more committed to this as, as a career, as something they do long-term, um, they're bearing the brunt in terms of health consequences uh, of, of, of what's happened. Thank you. Do you have any other questions or comments for Eli this afternoon? All right, looks like the room's clearing up for the weekend. So I just want to say thank you so much, Eli, for this fascinating you, presentation. Bye. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity. This was wonderful. And thank you all for your questions. <laughs> that was great to be able to dialogue. Yeah. Okay. Well, everyone have a great, a great afternoon and a great weekend. Thank, thank you. you.